As a matter of fact, thankfully, he will bless us with more of his music uh, throughout uh, the day. Now, ladies and gentlemen, of course, when we are at the Riga Security Forum, when we are talking about security, NATO is uh, never far from uh, the discussion. That's why we will kick off. We will kick off the 2019 Riga Security Forum with, indeed, the, the very pertinent issue of NATO, not just the past, but more importantly, the present and future, of course, of the alliance that is marking its 70th anniversary this year. And for that, we have wonderful speakers here assembled uh, for uh, this uh, very panel. I will introduce them in alphabetical order, ladies and gentlemen, from NATO. He is a Deputy, a Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and Security Policy. He's also a NATO Special Representative for Central Asia and the caucus, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wonderful to have him here. Please welcome James Apatharai, ladies and gentlemen. Please, please come up. <laughs> wonderful. Great to have you, James. Uh, delighted to welcome the former Assistant Secretary General office, for Defense Policy and Planning at NATO. Currently, he's a Senior Associate Fellow at the DGAP in Germany. Heinrich Braus, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, yes. Great to have you. Poland, Poland has already been mentioned, the gratitude Andres that has uh, conveyed to Poland. That's why we're delighted to, to have the former Polish Deputy Defense Minister with us. He's currently Poland's representative uh, to NATO. Tomasz Stadkowicz, ladies and gentlemen, is here. Great time. I see you did not get mic'd up, perhaps. Do we have a hand mic here, perhaps, for Thomas to save us some time? And last, but certainly not least, uh, we heard from the current president of Latvia. And now I'm delighted to welcome uh, the president who served this country very well from 2007 to 2011, former president Valdi Satters, ladies and gentlemen. Now, gentlemen, much to talk about uh, in the coming, uh, say, 70, 75 uh, uh, minutes, uh, James. Uh, NATO, 70th anniversary that this transatlantic alliance is uh, marking. Now, um, perhaps, perhaps before we look at the present challenges and perhaps more of the, the future challenges, let, let's afford, at a time when NATO is turning 70, let's afford to look, take a look back. Uh, what, in your opinion, and with the request of a brief answer, what, in your <laughs> opinion, is the biggest single accomplishment of NATO to date, looking back 70 years? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Actually, when I'm 70, if I can get out <coughs> of the chair, I'll be, uh, I'll be happy. Um, let me quote... Uh, and this is not something NATO officials normally do. So let me quote uh, the founder of the EU, uh, Jean Monnet. I feel a little bit uh, like a traitor, but uh, he said something very wise, which was um, the lessons of history are forgotten unless they're embedded in institutions. And probably the most important lesson of the 20th century <coughs> is that the security of Europe and the security of North America depends on maintaining the political and military presence of the United States in Europe. And this is something we have occasionally forgotten. We forgot before the First World War. We certainly forgot between the two world wars. But NATO was founded to establish a political and military presence for the US and Canada here. And through all the changes that we through in NATO and NATO has adapted, I think the most important thing NATO has achieved is to keep the United States and Canada here politically and militarily for our benefit and for Europe's benefit. So looking back at successful 70 years of North American engagement in, in this uh, continent, Heinrich Braus, uh, uh, not just from a German point of view, but uh, European point of view, NATO's accomplishments uh, in the past 70 years, you were obviously an integral part of the alliance uh, for many years. Uh, if you had to sum up the first 70 years, what's the biggest success, the biggest accomplishment of the alliance? I'm afraid I cannot give you one single answer. I have listed 12 points. Uh, well, at least not 70. So that, yeah. the, 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 you know. But I could. But that's one, the one for every year. Yeah. One for every year, exactly. Yeah. I fully agree with what James has said. NATO has as is the framework for the US presence, military presence in Europe. This is essential and need to continue. 
In other words, NATO binds together the two big global centers of Western democracy. With shared history, shared values, and I would still say similar strategic interests. And it provides the forum for the permanent dialogue um, in, in Brussels amongst 29 allies, initially 12, now 29, soon 30, about every security matter of common concern, which is often overlooked, but this is essential, that every day the allies speak to each other about each and every security matter. Now, these are the key strategic functions of NATO. Another one is that we manage to gather more than 40 partners around NATO. So we are the, we, former. We are the hub of a partnership network of more or less like-minded nations, which has proven to be enormously effective and important in our operations. They share the same burden with us. If you look quickly back, then we can the, see the incarnations of these strategic, enduring strategic functions over the 70 years. Cold War, I'm a child of the Cold War, where NATO managed to prevent war and maintain, maintain peace and liberty of the West, mm -hmm. which was the prerequisite to a degree for the fall of the Berlin Wall on the Iron Curtain. Mm -hmm. Second incarnation or manifestation NATO, together with the European Union, brought stability to the East, liberty to the East, and created the architecture which uh, President Bush father called a Europe whole and free mm -hmm. and at peace. Mm -hmm. So the combination of open door, integration of new members, you the Baltic states, mm -hmm. and enhanced cooperation, in, at least initially, with Russia, Ukraine, and others, has brought peace liberty, stability to the whole of Europe. And third, transformation, we went out to, to participate in crisis management. So NATO developed from a single focus to a multi-focus organization, and this is the characteristics of its adaptability, which is one of its biggest um, advantages. Indeed, adaptability, that is also what Rose Gottmuller told me uh, at the Munich Security Conference when I asked her on stage about NATO's greatest accomplishment, adaptability was one of the keys, uh, key words that uh, came up. Uh, now, uh, 70 years of NATO, uh, Poland has been part of those 70, 15 years, uh, 15 years out of uh, 70. So, so Tomasz um, uh, Szatkowski, I'm not going to ask you to perhaps look back at the 70 years, but perhaps dwell more upon what the past 15 years has meant for your country as far as NATO membership is concerned. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, thanks for the, uh, for being, uh, for, the, for the invitation to, for, the, for the distinguished panel and uh, thanks for the Polish ambassador for, for helping to make that uh, happen. Uh, we actually joined a couple of years earlier. Uh, we joined in 1999. But uh, I also wanted to say that uh, from the very beginning we uh, remembered uh, that we should uh, help to keep the doors uh, open and uh, the Polish Prime Minister at that time, uh, Jerzy Buzek, uh, at his speech at the Washington um, uh, summit in 1999, he already uh, he at the time spoke of the necessity to, to, to right. enlarge NATO to, uh, to Baltic states and I think it was a, an important act of historical uh, justice and justice to, to, to the um, uh, f uh, to your successful transformation from the imposed uh, um, Soviet um, uh, republic status into the successful independent uh, sta uh, state um, uh, regained. From the Polish um, perspective, I, th I I I think that all, all the 70 years of um, history of NATO are. Um, uh, relevant to the Polish history and the Baltic history as well, because uh, I can I totally agree with um, uh, Heiner Braus that one of the most important uh, achievements is the fact that uh, NATO alliance contributed to the successful end of the Cold War through, su to, through successful deterrence and through maintaining unity. And I think that uh, this uh, is the case today uh, as well. Uh, the alliance contributes to the cohesion and unity of the transatlantic um, uh, community. Uh, and uh, again, uh, since 2014, we are rebuilding the, our ability for 
um, uh, effective deterrence, which will have to be w with us for uh, coming years. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, 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 Latvian President for mentioning our contribution here. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that there's a very interesting linkage as we are speaking at the uh, street of uh, General Petris uh, Rajins, who was uh, very um, instrumental in the Latgalian campaign, uh, where Latvian and Polish forces fought together um, uh, to secure the independence of Latvia. It was the first mission of Polish tanks in the history, and now it's a f it's a it's the first mission of Polish tanks in the in, in NATO here in Latvia. So Poland's contribution, yes, please. Judging by the applause, obviously the Polish contribution, very much appreciated, of course, Poland member since 1999 for 20 years, not 15. I was misled, actually, by the title 15 of 70. <laughs> this is what the title was misled, of course, for two decades now, Poland, uh, integral part uh, of uh, NATO, President Zatler's. Now, um, your country, of course, has been a NATO member since 2004, uh, per perhaps uh, the, the most recent of all here uh, on uh, this panel. Perhaps you can speak to the relevance and importance and significance uh, of Na that NATO has had for your country. Ah, thank you very much uh, for being here. So I will start with the fundamentals, you know. Uh, especially the new member states and the 15 or 20 years, uh, that means much less than 70 years. We have to re re remember all the time the fundamentals. The first, that NATO is a military organization. That means uh, the main goal of NATO is to foster its military might, to adapt to new situations, and therefore the contribution 2% is essential. The second point is that uh, NATO is a collective defense organization. This is a basic principle, the collective defense of, of common territory. And therefore some even like-minded nations who live a part of, of NATO territory cannot be members. That's also true. Uh, uh, but uh, the third point is we should always remember that this is transatlantic organization and it, it must be remembered on both sides of Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so if we refer to, to Latvia and Baltic states in, in the last 15 years, this is an example of the adaptability and also increasing the military might. I was elected in 2007. There was no infrastructure, there was no planning for military actions in our area. And then we got the, the Georgia and Russian war. And this very great hesitation, but we managed to create contingency plans. And everybody thought, this is okay. It, I have to mention the air policing before, and many people said, it's for five years, it's for four years, maybe we extend it, but basically four fighter jets, you know. Uh, really stop the trespassing of, of Baltic borders. And uh, then came the, the Russian-Ukrainian war. And we had to adapt again. And now we have developed infrastructure military and NATO military presence uh, of many NATO member states, as mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So you see, NATO is capable to adapt mm -hmm. in quality and also in quantity. Clearly, very much your message very much consistent to what you've heard and what other high-ranking NATO officials have been saying here to mark the 70th anniversary. The flexibility and adaptability of the alliance has been key. But, uh, James, uh, that's one thing for us to reminisce uh, about the success uh, in the past 70 years. But there's no sugarcoating over the fact that uh, the, uh, we live in critical times, that the NATO is going through... Uh, some uh, motions. Uh, President Zattler said it's important that uh, the 70th anniversary and the success of NATO is being appreciated and remembered on both sides uh, of the aisle. Uh, th there's no tiptoeing around the fact that there's a U.S. president who perhaps doesn't have the same appetite for multilateralism and this particular alliance that his predecessors had. Um, now, Donald Trump doesn't seem to be a big fan uh, both of NATO and, and international alliances uh, in general. Without the United States, NATO is nothing though. How do we, is there a chance, how do we convince this president, how do we persuade this president of the importance of this alliance? Well, of course, we all know the discussions that have taken place and those of us who've been uh, at the summit last year in June, it was a bit of a roller coaster. But 
what I think is important to do is look at what's actually happening rather than looking only at the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So what has actually happened under uh, President Trump is that the United States has increased over what President Obama did, which was already more, but the U.S. has continued to increase the number of U.S. forces uh, in Europe, the amount of money that the U.S. puts into European defense, mm -hmm. the number of exercises that the United States is conducting in Europe, so the infrastructure is growing, the equipment levels are growing, the exercises are growing, there's more soldiers here. So actually, what they're doing is demonstrating not just continued U.S. commitment to NATO, but increased commitment to NATO. Then I would add, those of you who saw the Secretary General uh, when he went to the United States and spoke to Congress, mm -hmm. this was the first ever bipartisan, 100% support uh, for NATO on both sides of the aisle. Awareness of NATO is going up. So I think that's a very, very important foundation, but it is absolutely true that for this White House, 2% uh, is something they really mean. Uh, and I think previous presidents meant it and defense ministers meant it, he really means it. But actually, I think as we come closer to our leaders meeting at the end of the year, uh, if I was sitting in the White House, and I will never be sitting uh, in the White House, but if I was sitting You'll there, never know. Uh, yeah, it, it seems unlikely with my passport. <laughs> Uh, and for other reasons. But, uh, you know, I would see what's happening in NATO as a real success. Uh, we will be this year adding, NATO nations will have added $100 billion more to their defense budgets than they had planned to be doing three years ago. By the time we get to 2024, we're estimating that to be above $300 billion. We will have much stronger defense plans in place more equipment, more money to do the exercises that we need to do. So actually, NATO is much stronger, including, including, but not only, as a result of this White House's pressure on NATO to meet its commitments. So what you're saying basically is focus on the deeds and not tweets. This is what you're saying. Well, what I'm saying is that, but also we need to deliver to ensure that we continue to have uh, the full U.S. engagement. I mean, that is just a fact, mm -hmm. uh, and the Secretary General is committed to making sure this happens. Uh, Heinrich Fraus, uh, we, we just heard James saying this U.S. president uh, means it when he is insisting on burden sharing, on that every country spends 2% of its GDP on defense by 2024, as was agreed in Wales in 2014. Now, of course, Germany, Germany is a country that is repeatedly being singled out uh, by the U.S. <laughs> president and others for not fulfilling its uh, commitments. Uh, I know you're not speaking as a representative of the German government here, but, it, but I have to ask you, is the, is the criticism of Germany in this regard fair? First of all, I would like to, I mean, as a former NATO, agree with the present NATO representative. <laughs> Actions speak louder than deeds. And I attended a conference recently where Baltic representatives were saying we are happier with Trump than with Obama because Trump is delivering, or the administration is delivering what James has said, more forces, more money, more infrastructure, more exercises to this region in Europe. Mm -hmm. And this will continue. Number two, let's be honest, Trump's President Trump's tweets and his expressed doubts into multilateral institutions, the political disputes between the Europeans and the United States regarding trade, energy, and other things has not been helpful. It has created doubts in the un unity and cohesion of the NATO leadership. But NATO is not just about the presidents and the head of state government. NATO is daily practice in Brussels. And if you work with the American delegation who receive guidance and direction from the Pentagon or from the State Department, they are normal allies contributing significantly and from time to time even showing leadership to the development and adaptation and, uh, of NATO and make it more effective and implement all the decisions to enhance deterrence and defense, not to my country. If I were a diplomat, I would now give you a diplomatic answer because it's inappropriate to blame one's own country in another country. But let's be clear. We're amongst friends. Yes. Let's be clear. 
Here, President Trump has a point. It's not Trump who invented 2%. It was invented long ago. And it was uh, under Obama, where all the heads of state and government, as you put it, in the Wales, agreed for the first time in NATO history at heads of state and government level to achieve the 2% goal by 2024. And all this rhetoric aimed to move this blah, blah. I was there when it was being decided. It was a clear political commitment to achieve it by 2024. The Germans don't do that. And here they have to do much better. But, let's be fair, would you ever, ever have believed that Germany would lead a multinational battle group in Lithuania 10 years ago or five years ago? No. Would you have believed that Germany would provide the second largest contingent to Afghanistan, RSM? No. Would you have believed that they continue to contribute 1,000 soldiers for Mali, etc., so they have done a lot? And also La von der Malayan managed to increase the defense budget this year by 5 billion euro, which <laughs> in German, German, under German conditions, is a lot. However, for me it's unacceptable that the German, German government, the coalition, has committed to 2% in 2014, confirmed in 2016 at Warsaw confirmed in 2018 in Brussels, and now appear or give the impression not to stick to it. Mm -hmm. It's not to please President Trump, right. but the whole discussion is awkward. It's about the readiness of the German armed forces and the in fulfillment of the capability targets needed to fulfill their mission. That is the reason for 2%. Mm -hmm. So the criticism directed towards Germany in this particular regard, at least, is fair. Germany needs to do more uh, here on uh, this front. Thomas, uh, one of the countries that is already fulfilling uh, its share of commitment is Poland already. It doesn't have, didn't wait until 2024, is already paying 2% and even more, I believe, of its GDP for uh, defense spending. If, if you look at the debates uh, of burden sharing and solidarity within the alliance, what's your take? Well, what's your assessment? Well, it's actually, uh, it's really difficult because, you know, <laughs> from uh, in Poland, we don't have much debate on that because, the, I mean, we're, we're in this lucky situation that public understands the need to, to, to spend, I mean, to provide for, for our defense. We also understand that uh, if we are to expect um, um, security contribution from others, we also need to contribute uh, to the security of our, of our allies. So it's, I mean, uh, it's really d difficult to think of the, uh, the arguments we don't, because we don't need to, to use many of them in a, in, a, in, a, in a debate in Poland. I mean, a very lucky situation, I'm afraid. But since, since I d I'm not going to sp speak too long on that, let me just join uh, the, my predecessors in saying that, indeed, the rhetoric is one thing, uh, and I see it more as a bargaining ta tactic, at, at, and, and at the same time we see more um, activity on, uh, in terms of the U.S. presence. Also, Poland signed with the U.S. Uh, very recently uh, an agreement on increasing the U.S. presence in Poland, which actually, actually solidified, because the, so far the U.S. presence, uh, except of the EFP presence uh, also in Poland, has been a, ver a rather temporary measure. Now it's an um, enduring presence. Uh, this is the wording from the uh, agreement be between between uh, between uh, Polish and the U.S. Uh, presidents, President Trump, mm. in this case. So, so permanent establishment of U.S. military uh, presence. The enduring is the word that, that is uh, used in the enduring. In the well, we can. Uh, it's rhetoric at the end of the day, no, but uh, but I uh, but I think very important you, one. you and I know uh, what we both need. But if we look at the challenges, presidents, others, if we look at the many challenges that uh, NATO is facing today, if I were to ask you to to identify the single biggest threat that the alliance is facing today in 2019, what would it be? Uh, come back to the principle of territorial defense. Look at the outer borders. Uh, can you imagine Mexico attacking the United States? I would say nobody will. Very yeah. unlikely. Yeah, then you go around the outer borders and then you see maybe, you know, that there are some risks in the Middle East, but not too much. There are, I think, zero the risks in, in, in Caucasus. Uh, there's no risk on, on, on Switzerland and on Austrian borders, you know, and there's no risk on, uh, on Finnish or, or, or Swedish borders. And what's left? The only neighbor, you know, what's left is Russia. And uh, what's on the, who is on the borderline? The, the Baltic states. 
So and, uh, this is a critical point, because if uh, Montenegro would be a critical point, the Latvian soldiers would be in, uh, in Montenegro. No, it's opposite, you know. We are talking about the Balkans as an explosive area, but you see, you know, Montenegro soldiers are here mm -hmm. because it's much more important. So we are on the borderline, and we should, uh, as a member state, full-pledged member state, uh, really contribute to the host nation uh, support. So we have to develop the military infrastructure just to, to accumulate the strengths of NATO if it's necessary. And uh, one more point, you know, uh, people are really excited about uh, NATO Article 5's umbrella. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of years ago, I just understood the umbrella will come when we will be totally wet already. So we have to work on deterrence. Mm -hmm. And then practically, you know, diplomatic uh, efforts are also necessary. So maybe we have lost the momentum of getting Sweden and Finland in NATO, because when there was a real threat, they were hesitating a little bit, but they were ready. Now when the threat is fading, you know, they say it's a necessary measure to be in NATO. Mm -hmm. Nobody in my country will say it's a necessary measure to be in NATO. But then you understand, Baltic states being in NATO, you know, this is also a question of security of Sweden and Finland. Mm -hmm. And we play a very important role. So I hear you loud and clear. You are concerned. Uh, you're, you are concerned about Russian aggression in the Baltics, in this part of the neighborhood. You see, uh, we don't feel uh, there is a real military threat today. Mm. We don't think so. Okay, but the day may come, and uh, you see the experience of uh, Russian-Georgian war and Russian-Ukrainian war, especially. You know, when we are really a little bit afraid and scared. You know, and we had to change a lot of things in our leadership in our governance of our country, you know, and also in our military governance. Mm -hmm. And also uh, we revised our membership uh, obligations. So we really understand that we are on the borderline. Mm -hmm. And that's important that the other countries, member states, understand it too. J James Apatura, uh, President uh, Zatar says, just identified uh, Russian aggression uh, towards its neighbors as the single biggest threat that the alliance is facing in the 21st century. Would you concur? Uh, in, in a short answer, uh, probably yes, but I think it needs a longer answer. Uh, yes. I remember this quote from, I think it was Yeltsin when he was asked in the United States, some journalist said, could you, Mr. President, uh, describe the Russian economy in one word? And he said, good. And then the next journalist said, can you describe it in two words? And he said, not good. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it was funny. Uh, but I, I think we need a bigger answer. I mean, if you look at the uh, effort that NATO's putting in, in terms of intelligence, preparation, military preparations, uh, diplomatic efforts, uh, and actually if you just look at the full spectrum of pressure that Russia's putting on mm -hmm. our countries, which is military, which is cyber attacks, which is hybrid attacks, which is, you know, killing people in the United Kingdom with chemical weapons, you could go on and on. Uh, I think you'd have to say that the biggest challenge NATO faces is Russia, but mm. NATO is forced to now look also south, uh, and we have a substantial challenge which we share with our partners to the south. I don't want to say they're the problem. They face the same problems, mm. which is uh, terrorist networks, which is uncontrolled migration, which causes uh, political problems for them and political problems for us. Uh, and. Uh, and so we have to look south as well, and NATO has adapted very substantially, I won't go into the details, to try to help contribute to security uh, in the south as well. Uh, and then, of course, there's a whole range of new developing challenges, and the president mentioned some of them, and uh, disruptive technologies uh, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, and how these are being uh, adopted mm -hmm. by our um, uh, competitors mm -hmm. is something that we're just now coming to grips with but what we're going to be facing is peer-to-peer -peer conflict preparation mm -hmm. against uh, countries which uh, in the past NATO could outmatch easily mm -hmm. but now with disruptive technologies we have to come to grips with the fact that we need to invest in this as well so there's a whole range of challenges right. but I'll just stop on the final point I think the president spent time on something which we all need to face up to and that is uh, the societal effects of the uh, sort of 
post-truth period that we're in. Uh, that is something I think you know we could maybe discuss, uh, but it is very, very important that we come to grips with it. Very critical element indeed. Uh, fake news spreading, uh, distortion, cybersecurity, mm. all these uh, which you have touched upon, <laughs> all these uh, big threats uh, that the alliance is facing. In fact, Western civilizations, if, if you will, to even broaden it out, Heinrich Braus, uh, threats to NATO in the 21st century. I tend to agree better, I couldn't agree more with uh, President Salter. It's completely right what James is saying, that NATO is an alliance of 29 nations, north, east, southeast, south, west. They all are united, and we manage to achieve consensus, not every day, but when it is important, we manage to achieve that for the ministerials and for the heads of state and government meetings. That's a great, great achievement and advantage. Number two, nevertheless, Norway has a different strategic perception than Turkey. Portugal, a completely different strategic assessment than Estonia, Latvia, or Baltic states together. And NATO has to take consideration of that. We call it at NATO, we have to make sure that we have a 360 degree approach to security. Mm -hmm. And um, Provisions against or with a view to Russia are as important as against terrorism, instability in the South. However, my personal view is the biggest and most dangerous potential military and geopolitical threat is generated by Russia. And the Baltic states and Poland are bordering Russia directly. And what is so concerning is Russia's strategy its policy of constant confrontation and provocation of the West. And its whole spectrum of instruments and means from daily disinformation campaigns and propaganda up to threatening with nuclear exercises and nuclear, the use of nuclear weapons. And the whole spectrum is available. And from a military strategic point of view, what is concerning is that Russia, of course, cannot compete with NATO as a whole militarily. They know that. But they are trying to achieve regional military superiority in this region. And the recent decision, or which has become obvious, that they have deployed intermediate nuclear-capable missiles threatening Europe, but not the US, is strategically concerning because it could nurture the perception in Moscow that they have the escalation dominance regionally mm -hmm. and could take the risk in a crisis if Putin needs a success to create a so-called fait accompli mm -hmm. with a limited land grab in this region, mm -hmm. flanked and covered and supported by a nuclear threat. And this is what NATO need to analyze and need to develop in terms of deterrence, how to neutralize and deny the Russian leadership, those options mm -hmm. which would become extremely destabilizing in a crisis. Mm -hmm. and that is what, we are, what NATO is currently working right. on. And that is why we need also to think of strengthening conventional presence in this region. One last word, Ali, to the Baltic friends. Don't underestimate in this context the importance and the deterrence value of enhanced forward presence. It's multinational, combat ready, representing NATO as a whole, not only your country, but the Russians would immediately be confronted with forces provided by NATO ready to fight. And everywhere are the three nuclear powers, the US, the French, and the UK, and the strongest <coughs> European nation, Germany. In other words, from the very beginning, Russia would be confronted with the risk of an uncalculated escalation which they don't want. Tomasz right. Szatkowicz, uh, clearly when uh, both uh, Heinrich Braus and President Zadler spoke, you nodded uh, very strongly. Clearly your government has uh, made no secret of the fact uh, that it does consider uh, Russia a threat, particularly to its uh, own uh, security. Do you think the alliance is up? Do, do you think the alliance is up to facing such a Russian uh, aggression? Do you think the alliance is, 
is ready and equipped to deal with these threats. Yeah, uh, two points uh, in the beginning. Uh, uh, first, uh, I, I, let me disagree subtly with uh, President Adler on, on the fact of whether we face the threat at the moment or not. I think that when we think of a threat, in this case Russian threat, I mean, there are two uh, uh, sort of uh, factors. One is intent, the second is capabilities. We can never judge very, uh, I mean, um, well, we're not sitting in, in, in the head of Vladimir Putin, so we, we cannot judge um, intents uh, very, uh, I mean, adequately, but uh, the capabilities are there, and capabilities have been de de developed since Vladimir Putin came to power since 2000. So uh, they've been spending a lot, and, and uh, Heiner Braus uh, outlined very eloquently the holistic nature of the of the uh, threat. On whether we are um, prepared or not, um, in 2014 NATO has um, signaled and in 2016, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, intent to start to rebalance toward being able to, to um, tackle this threat. And in 2016 in the Warsaw Summit, NATO has undertaken important decisions starting the process, uh, laying the foundations and here I uh, cannot um, I, I, I have to give recognition to uh, Heiner Braus, who was very instrumental in bringing those um, um, processes uh, about. But we haven't finished them, them yet. They are, I cannot speak of everything that is going on in the, in the Alliance because much of that is classified, but we are, um, uh, we are finalizing. I mean, and the, there are a couple of um, um, pillars of that. I mean, there's plans, this is capabilities, readiness of forces. And um, uh, command and control structure. Actually, command and control is largely um, uh, um, finished and now is being implemented. But um, re regardless of change of atmospherics in relations with Russia that might happen in, in coming months, uh, we cannot let ourselves be caught uh, in the same situation as it was in 2014 without adequate plans, without uh, forces ready and, and assigned. Mm -hmm. um, because we, if Atmospheric change, you cannot create plans in a couple of weeks. You, you cannot prepare forces in a, in a matter of weeks. So we have to finalize the, the process that, that will start anymore. So, so big readiness, uh, uh, there's still room for improvement and to learn the right lessons from 2000. Uh, 14. To uh, basically, to, to implement what was decided in Warsaw. What was decided. Uh, President Zatlas, before I bring in the audience for, for a couple of questions from, from the audience. Now, your country joined in 2004, Poland joined in 1999. Now the question is, of course, uh, what about enlargement? What about the future of this alliance? Uh, we have uh, Montenegro joined in 2017, Northern Macedonia is about to become Coming, so. the next one. But you know there are other countries knocking on NATO's doors, wanting to become a, a member. What, do you, what do you think about the enlargement of the alliance? Very positively, because we have the positive experience of our region. Mm -hmm. So NATO coming to the to Baltics, you know, increased Baltic security, I would say, 1,000%. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's an evidence. NATO coming into Balkans, you know, is doing is performing in the same way and creating the same feeling of security, you know, mm -hmm. and even you know the name issue which delayed the, the Northern Macedonian uh, membership for ten years. I was present when Greeks vetoed, uh, and I said why, and they couldn't explain. So sometimes something happens irrationally, or because of internal politics. Mm -hmm. But uh, okay, we have to see the next members. And the next member who is really ready, and uh, many military experts say that they are more than ready, is Georgia. But then the political issue comes out, you know, uh, with the occupied territories. And I was pres present uh, two days ago in, in McCain's conference in Tbilisi, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, former General Secretary Rasmussen said, at least publicly, that, uh, okay, maybe you can join like Germany, you know. It's a part of the territory, and uh, they, they say, and then use diplomatic uh, efforts, you know, to get back the occupied territories. Mm -hmm. And this was also declared by the Georgian president. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I had a dinner then with the former president, and I asked, you know, what are you going to do? Because the first, the Georgians themselves have to make the decision. Mm -hmm. And he said, we are discussing it, this topic already two years, but we are not, you know, bold enough to come out in public. Rasmussen was bold enough to come in in the public. So, but sometimes we have to understand that if we hesitate, 
we create trouble. We hesitated to give the membership action plans to, to Georgia uh, in Bucharest. Uh, President Bush hesitated to say no in Sochi a few weeks later to put in no. So if we hesitate and we keep this situation that they are ready, but they, we, they need some signal too, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, when uh, the Russian diplomats you know, and former politicians, they say, um, the West was not fair with us because they promised not to enlarge uh, NATO, yeah, including the, the Baltic states. Mm -hmm. I said, it's nothing to say about West. Yeah. It's about us, Baltics, because yeah. that was our democratic decision mm -hmm. and NATO, as a, as a part of the Western world, can say no. Mm -hmm. And if the Georgians say, we are ready, please, mm -hmm. we have to discuss this topic, and maybe we, it's very important to, to kick off this point that they are too ready already, you know, but we, we all are hesitating. And again about the Russia, the perception uh, what the Russia will do is a very difficult one, because we have to understand how they think, what are their perception, and we see that if their basic strategy and tactic is to weaken NATO, to weaken EU, that means they're weak themselves. Mm -hmm. Strong guys don't, don't do that. Mm -hmm. So they have some in, in uncertainty about themselves. So they try to weaken us, to create us problems, create conflicts and so on. So we have to revise our attitude towards Russia. Mm -hmm. We really have to find some new approaches mm -hmm. because we have only this, let's not tease, mm -hmm. it's not working. Mm -hmm. Let's engage, that's good, but we don't know how to do. So we have a lot of questions to discuss in between ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the current strategy in dealing with Russia it needs to be revisited, uh, uh, says uh, President uh, Zaftars. Before I go to the audience, uh, James Apatharai, you are NATO Special Representative for Central Asia and the Caucasus. I know you just came back from Georgia uh, yourself, and we talk about uh, enlargement uh, is the issue here. Uh, what's your take? Would you agree with President Zaftars? It's better sooner than later. Let's bring him in. Personally, from a purely me point of view, of course I'd like to see them in. And the Allies have committed to that, uh, that they will become members. But the reason it hasn't happened is it's unfortunate, but pretty clear, because there's three, in essence, conditions for this to happen. One is that the country has to be ready. And there are many Allies who think that there is still quite a lot of reform to happen. I don't want to undersell at all what the Georgians have done. That President country, Zadler says they're more than ready. Well, they have transformed <laughs> over the last 10 years. That's absolutely true, and they contribute a huge amount to international operations, but I, I actually oversee the reform program that NATO has in Georgia, and there is definitely more to do. The second point is that NATO has to be ready, and mm -hmm. without going into too much detail, I think everybody knows the discussions that go on in European countries about enlargement in the larger sense and the political complications of that. So that is something that would have to be discussed now. And the third point is, and this is in the NATO charter, mm -hmm. that enlargement has to contribute to Euro-Atlantic security. Mm -hmm. In other words, if bringing this country into NATO undermines mm -hmm. the broader Euro-Atlantic Euro security, then that's something we need to look at. Mm -hmm. And in the current international environment, there are NATO countries that believe that this would not be in Georgia's interest, it would not be in NATO's interest, and it wouldn't be uh, contributing to broader Euro-Atlantic security, and that we need to work on reform and support the reform, which is very successful, work on the broader international environment, but maintain the commitment to Georgia that it will happen. So that's where we are now. Uh, and whatever I wish uh, for, or anyone else wish for, wishes for, that is just the political reality of the right. alliance now. Still work to be done on this particular front. Ladies and gentlemen, let, let's bring in some uh, audience members, some questions here, let's bring it up. Uh, we already have, uh, do we have microphones? Do we have microphones uh, in the room for, for, to be passed around? Yes, microphone is, is right there. Hand, hand it to the gentleman there. Please introduce yourself quickly. Yes, uh, James Scher from Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at ICDS and also a panelist at this conference. You uh, all rightly said that we have had to accustom ourselves to draw a distinction between President Trump and his administration and the foreign policy establishment of the United States. 
My question is, do we now also have to go through that exercise with regard to France, <laughs> whose president states that uh, a new European security order is needed, that includes Russia, and that Europe needs an autonomous European army? Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Please take notes, because I'm going to do the rounds. Uh, I think it's much more effective. Uh, I'm coming to you. The lady here in the second row, I have you all in mind. Am I, if I'm overseeing anyone up there, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's because the light is actually blinding me. So just, uh, just let me know. Go right ahead. Yep. Uh, thank you, Christine Verzinger. I work for the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund. The conversation here about NATO is darting back and forth between old territorial risks that are ongoing and many of the new challenges from cognitive war, uh, AI, uh, machine learning, and so forth. There are so many new challenges, so many balls in the air, it's hard to make sure that one of them doesn't drop, and we can't afford to have one of them drop. So who can help us? Someone I ha something I haven't heard from the panel is, talk is a discussion of the EU or other partnerships that are essential. Where do we get the human resources, the financial resources, to make sure that we're on top of this? And what should be NATO's task? And what can we give to others uh, so that we're stronger all together? All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, gentleman here in the second uh, row, from another voice from Estonia. Well, uh, thank you, Senzakov. Uh, this is very loud uh, from Tallinn ICDS. Uh, my question is about the argument what we have heard so many times and also here that uh, deeds um, uh, should be followed, not the tweets. So let's look at the deeds lately. Uh, Trump has hit its allies with steel and aluminium tariffs uh, on its national security grounds, uh, has cancelled 700 million investment into European security in order to pay for a border wall, has cancelled or deferred, stopped 250 million for the support of the Ukrainian military, um, has tried very hard, I have heard, uh, to get Russia readmitted to G8. So these are the deeds. So isn't this argument really getting a bit thin after two and a half years? Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, over there in the back, uh, take one or two and then we'll throw it back uh, to the audience. I think we have quite a lot of meat to go with you. Please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Dallas Taylor. I'm from the US. Um, I'm just a citizen where, that's married to a Latvian and we're going through the repatriation program. And so I've learned a lot about Latvia over the last 10 years from the grandparents and what they have gone through World War II. But it's only been through the last 10 years and I can see a big void in our media in the US um, that's somewhat schizophrenic from time to time. Um, but I can see where RT has, and the Russian have a lot of influence and they're taking a lot of efforts to snipe at Latvia specifically. And I'm just wondering what efforts are being made, um, what other representatives from the US may be here today, and what efforts are being made to put more uh, voices and influence into the media aside from the traditional media that has somewhat lost the trust of the U.S. population. All right. Th thank, you. thank you so much. Paul Diaz. Thank you, sir. One, one last round. I'm looking in the audience. Up, up there, I'm not forgetting anyone. Okay. I think we have quite a, quite a few questions here that we can go by. We go by, by the round, and, and everybody, of course, is going to uh, chime in, James. Uh, per, take whatever question appeals to you, perhaps, if we do look, because you made the argument Let's not focus on the tweets. Let's focus on the deeds and uh, U.S. commitment. But uh, the, the gentleman from Estonia is saying, well, let's focus on the deeds. And it's, uh, the record is not, it's not looking that good. Thanks. Um, and I'll, I'll spend a, just a couple of sentences on a few of these. I, I see what you're saying. And I, I could add to that list of disagreements between the U.S. and its European allies uh, on climate and on Iran and on all sorts of issues. I think in general, obviously, Ukraine is not a NATO country. so. Um, the U.S. support for that is actually very substantial, but uh, maybe a few items haven't arrived uh, just yet, and those are new items. But overall, I think what's important to focus on is the security aspects, because that's what we have to look at. And if you look at the weight of what the U.S. is doing, it has gone up under Trump by billions, uh, by thousands of soldiers, by enduring uh, presence, 
in, uh, in Poland soon, and that is very politically and militarily substantial. So you're right, there are some issues, but I think the weight of the reality is, is actually very much in line with the um, strengthened U.S. Mm -hmm. position here. Let me just say one sentence. Uh, nobody here, I think, said we have to distinguish between the administration and the White House. What we have said is what you said, the tweets and the, and the reality. That's an important uh, distinction from uh, deep state people. Um, on, uh, on France, I would say two things. One is the French are active in NATO, very active. Uh, and they're here in this region, and they're everywhere. Uh, so I, I think there's no question about the French active commitment to what NATO is doing. Uh, when France decides to do something, they do it, and they do it seriously. But, you know, I, I think we, we have to be realistic here. These discussions about transatlantic unity have mm -hmm. also triggered in the EU uh, a bit of a hedging strategy uh, and a desire to have more capacity to do things on their own. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's what you hear coming out of, out of France now, but that's not new. I would just say this, and I, I'm going to speak on a personal basis, not NATO policy, but I think we have to be very, very realistic about what the EU can do mm -hmm. on its own and what it cannot do. The EU is not capable of providing a full defense in the way that NATO provides it. It doesn't have the forces. It doesn't have the money. It doesn't have a nuclear umbrella. It doesn't have a command structure. It doesn't have a unified approach, and it wouldn't because, of course, many EU countries see their security as best assured by the United States. So I think we cannot have fantasies about an entirely, completely separate European Union defense like NATO. So but PESCO is a fantasy? No, no, no. PESCO oh. is very targeted capability improvements which are what the EU needs and NATO supports it. So I think we need to draw a distinction between what the European leaders say and how it's interpreted. What they're saying is the EU needs to be able to do more on its own. We support that. The US supports that. That's burden sharing. It cannot be that the US has to be part of everything. So let me give you an example and then I'll stop talking. I, I won't take the other questions. When the Libya operation began, uh, it was European countries in the lead, France, UK, and after a few days, they said, okay, we're running out of weapons, mm -hmm. bombs. We need them from the US, so the US provided them. Then they said, we need help targeting. We can't find the targets. We need the US, the US helped them. We need to suppress enemy air defense. We need the US, so the US came. We need command and control. We can't command, even in one environment close to home, the air. We can't do it all on our own. The US came mm -hmm. to do it. So this is not a situation Europe wants to be in. It's not a situation the United States wants to be in. So the, the Europe getting stronger and better able to contribute to operations in its own neighborhood or further afield through PESCO and other initiatives is only good for the transatlantic uh, alliance. Mm -hmm. Heinrich Braus, uh, many questions uh, we heard uh, gotten from the audience. Which one would you like to tackle? Uh, not all of them. What James just told you about the Libya operation was top secret, so be aware. <laughs> okay, so we're cutting the live stream right now. <laughs> that, was, that was quite public. But it was the truth. As opposed to this talk about a European army, a senior European colleague of us, mine, constantly saying if somebody is asking you about the European army, that is fake news. And this is being stated by a European Union representative who is in charge for European capability development, for the capability development plan and all the other things. And I share this view. Um, for all the reasons James told you, there's another concept that's still strategic autonomy. This is extremely misleading. Mm. All the European mm -hmm. Union members need to explain what they mean and what the French mean by strategic autonomy is the Europeans being capable to engage in crisis management operations, safe middle, in the strategic periphery of uh, Europe. And they need to be able to independently assess, independently plan, and independently decide 
but they agree that they cannot do that normally without partners, including U.S., but they need to be able to do that. What they do not mean is what, for me, strategic autonomy implies. If you take the words by themselves, strategic and autonomy, nuclear deterrence, no way that the European Union will provide nuclear deterrence for the European Union. The French will not do it. The Brits are leaving the Union. Collective defense by the European Union, no way. The Europeans themselves are lacking the capabilities needed to provide for collective defense of the whole of Europe. And let's not forget, Northern Norway, North Atlantic, Baltic region, this region here, Black Sea region, Mediterranean, and Atlantic. La Army, Air Force, Navy, Special Forces required to do that. Mm. Number three, they would need to be able to engage in global crisis management in support of the US, for example. That said, the European Union is not striving for that. Let's be very clear. At the same time, the European Union and NATO share 22 of the same members. So we are talking about the Europeans in NATO as well. And what is true is that the Europeans in NATO and in the European Union need to do much more to provide for fair burden sharing, provide for high-end capabilities, provide for high readiness forces, provide for strategic enablers, for the Europeans to become a valuable partner to the US that can really share strategic burdens with them. And that if we could prove to Trump and his administration that we are doing that, that we are now our way to achieving that, much would have been achieved. Number three, yes, NATO needs a European Union because the European Union can provide for much more than military. In crisis management, we will need a range of civilian, political, diplomatic, economic, and humanitarian instruments to create a comprehensive approach. And NATO has acknowledged it. It's our lesson learned from Afghanistan, which is one reason why we are now so cautious to engage militarily in the South, but prefer to work with partners there and enable them to provide for their own security by train, assist, support, training missions, etc. what he is partially doing. And number three, there's an elephant in the room, it's China. US and the Europeans need to face the strategic challenge generated and emerging from China as a strategic competitor. It's a mantra in Washington, and the, the Americans, not just President Trump, the whole Congress expects us, the Europeans, to acknowledge that China is a competitor and to take side and to work with the Americans to deal with this emerging strategic challenge, and we have to do it. Tomas Shatkovsky, uh, let's get your take uh, on your personal answers to the questions that were posed. Yeah, uh, well, since I'm in a diplomatic role, it's uh, difficult for me to comment on uh, activities of, of, of allied uh, heads of state. Uh, but I think it would be equally unfair to either uh, President Trump to speak of his uh, ideas regarding the G8 without mentioning uh, similar uh, uh, willingness to engage in dialogue with Russia by President Macron or uh, the, the German leadership. At the same time, it would be equally unfair to France to speak of their uh, recent activities with regard to dialogue with Russia without mentioning French uh, contribution uh, in the eastern flank as we highlighted the U.S. contribution in the, uh, in the, in the region. And here, again, I would, uh, with regard to the U.S., I would... Uh, to spend second sack of points, uh, I would um, still think it's more important. That, I mean, the increase uh, and the contribution to the deterrence, uh, from my perspective, is more important than than those debat some debatable uh, facts that, that 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 you have mentioned. On the European um, uh, army and autonomous uh, strategic autonomy, let me say I think the European army is being used as a uh, smoke screen for uh, for other um, issues. I, I mean, everybody who's serious and engaged in debate knows that it, it's not really a uh, any reality. 
Um, I think that indeed, as Europeans, we can do more f uh, in terms of uh, capabilities together, uh, both for EU missions and NATO missions. Too often, unfortunately, uh, the word Europe and uh, adjective European is being um, uh, used to disguise some national and industrial uh, interests. And uh, wh whereas there are some simple things that could be done, uh, for instance, uh, in order to make uh, battle groups more usable, right now as we speak, there is a Polish-led Visegrad battle group on the, um, uh, in its readiness um, uh, status. 2,000 troops trained, certified with the equipment are being unused for, uh, for for the next uh, time, whereas, I mean, there's a question of will and some small budget to make them um, uh, deployable. Um, and uh, also, to be fair, there was a question on, uh, which I didn't really get, I mean, uh, on the partnerships between the, uh, on, on uh, countering those new, uh, well, I mean, indeed, I mean, it seems like, seem, uh, as a West, we, we started to la lag behind in things like, for instance, 5G. We need to resort to co cooperation with uh, partners, but we also have to look uh, within um, our uh, borders. And here, I think the contribution of Baltic states could could be very important. Here, uh, since there's some very interesting um, uh, developments in um, uh, software and IT uh, sector, which, which makes difference between small and uh, b big actors less um, uh, relevant. Right. President Zatler, your res your responses. So about Macron saying, you know, we need new security system, my question is just why? Because we have system that works. And engaging uh, Russia in security system, that means engaging a, a, a partner with whom we cannot trust, who really withdraws from the treaties, who, you know, uh, invades uh, and uh, annexes uh, territories in Europe, and whose signature is nothing uh, uh, under the any, any, any agreement. So we can't make an agreement. We, at first, we have to restore the trust. And how to do that? This is a very difficult question. Mm -hmm. I think the trust will come after Putin and after solving Ukraine, Ukraine's problem. Mm -hmm. So about EU army, you know, I was really surprised you know, when the French president and the German chancellor come out with such a very serious uh, proposal. Uh, n n nothing to say. They didn't say anything about what do they mean by that. At the same time, uh, my, my uh, uh, let's say, idea is that the, the next day the Russians kept, you know, not sleeping next night, you know, to finding out what does it mean. Uh, and of course, first of all, we have to understand that we had very clear arguments mm -hmm. that the tr in a traditional sense, you know, EU army is nonsense. So what we can't talk about, to my mind, is in, about the military industry, United Military Industry EU to pay much more attention of economic support for the military structures. Uh, so, and it's also a question about the hybrid. Uh, you see, China and Russia are absolutely different countries with different philosophies, with different perception of their role in the global affairs as well as the, uh, 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 how they, the perception how they manage their own countries. They're so different, but uh, let's say the, the hybrid attacks from Russia are attacks from the West. They don't have attacks to the, to, to the China because the China is too strong internally. Mm -hmm. So China's hybrid attacks, uh, mostly they collect the information. It's, they spy for, for, for mm -hmm. technical reasons, a lot, a lot, and then of course of military. But uh, let's say this is a very fast changing world. And what we say about the hybrid warfare and uh, the hybrid threats today will, will not be relevant two days after. Mm -hmm. So again, we come back when we started. You know, we need a very fast, flexible adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, James, uh, the gentleman, the American yeah. gentleman had a question. I don't want to overlook his question. And speaks to the hybrid warfare about information, to getting it out there. What's your take? Absolutely. And I, I really have a sort of personal interest in this because I used to work in the media uh, world in, in NATO. Uh, but also because, you know, my, my nephew, who's a young guy uh, and doesn't earn a lot of money and lives in Toronto, where I'm from, and then, uh, then he said, sent this message, yeah, you are encircling Russia and you are promoting a color revolution. I said, what are you talking about? Uh, and then it turned out that uh, the only Which free television uh, that he could access in Toronto was RT. So mm -hmm. even there, uh, you know, far away from here, it's very effective. 
And this is part of a much larger problem. I would commend to all of you uh, a book by a guy named Peter Pomerantsov who wrote uh, a title of a, an incredible book, but the title says it all, and that is, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. And he grew up in the Russian propaganda system and explains it in this book, and now he has a new book out as well, but it tells you exactly what's happening, so I really recommend it to you. And that's the situation we're in. Increasingly, nobody believes anything. Everything is your viewpoint. There are exactly, as the president said, 31 theories for who shot down MH17. So one of them might be true, but you don't know, so you give up. Uh, and this problem is only going to get worse. So we need to fight back. Uh, we need to, first and foremost, uh, preserve the integrity of our institutions, and that means our media. People have to trust the media. Uh, and we looked into, uh, we, by the way, when I say we, the center of excellence here does a fantastic job uh, when it comes to strategic communications. And one of the things they did was look at why France was so resistant to uh, outside interference for their elections. And uh, it was very interesting. A couple of things they found was that people in France have high confidence in their institutions, their media, so they go to trusted sources, even online, which is not the case in other countries. And second, that they don't get their news from social media. Uh, it's only 20% get their news from social media. So that's really a big vulnerability for countries that are heavily dependent on getting news from social media. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a million steps that need to be taken. Uh, in Belgium, children get every week an hour of education on how to tell fake news. Young kids check the URL, check the sources. They all know now to be suspicious of what they see. And I think that's something every country should have. They have training programs for the media. So the media is taught how not to be fooled uh, by mm -hmm. soon deep fakes and other things. Mm -hmm. So these are programs that across the alliance we need to, to take into account. The EU and NATO are working very closely uh, on this, but in the end it's a national responsibility to preserve their institutions, educate mm -hmm. the media, educate the children, f weed out and defend against outside malign outside ownership or interference into your media. But I'll give you one more example and then I'll stop. I, I talked to a, a friend who's running a very, very big global institution that looks at uh, social media and online interference. And he was telling me that one of the things that's being done by the Russians now is to uh, influence Mexican social media. And the reason they do it is because millions of Americans get their news from Mexican Spanish language sites. Uh, but nobody's paying attention to it. The Mexican government doesn't, the American government doesn't. And as a result, millions of people are being affected unseen by this tactic. So it is, I say this to say we need global mm -hmm. or Western concerted efforts. It cannot be done uh, within your own borders because this is, doesn't respect borders. Media awareness, media training cannot start early enough uh, in these environments. Indeed, the case of Belgium, to be frank, I was unknown to me. Uh, quite interesting to hear mm -hmm. about that. Uh, gentlemen, we're almost out of time. We're almost out of time. But we started, we started this session looking back. We started this session reminiscing about the first uh, 70 years. In the remaining minutes, and I would ask you to be very brief, uh, let's afford ourselves to look forward. So we've done this obviously throughout the past 75, 80 minutes, but very shortly, the, the alliance was relevant in the past 70 years. I think we have all agreed upon this. It has served the purpose. Will NATO be still relevant in the future? What's ahead? So, uh, let's start here, uh, James. I think NATO has the uh, privilege of having to be relevant because there is no way to substitute for it. Uh, it, is, it provides a unique function. It provides capabilities, and I mean this in the broadest sense, that nobody else can, no other structure can provide. So actually, I'm quite sure NATO will stay around because the allies just have to have it. Uh, but it requires the word we started with, which is adaptability. I think that actually is happening. You will see at the summit that we have in December. All kinds of new forward-looking uh, ideas, a broad international perspective, a new focus on emerging and disruptive technologies, for example. 
so I, I'm pretty sure NATO has demonstrated it can adapt. We are adapting, and I'm sure that will continue. Mm, the summit then in London in uh, yeah, December. December. Heinrich Draus, uh, uh, looking at the uh, glass bowl here, the future of NATO, will the alliance still remain relevant? Let me make a differentiation between the short and midterm perspective. In NATO, we talk about short term up to six years, NATO defense planning, and midterm up to 19 years, which a normal politician cannot think of, I would <coughs> stipulate and suggest. With that in mind, NATO's relevance will not change, but will increase. We are, North America and Europe, we are increasingly challenged by authoritarian systems and, and uh, uh, way of lives, if you wish. It's not just Russia, but also in the future, China. We as Europe and North America are challenged by terrorism from wherever. We are challenged by hybrid, what we in the West call hybrid warfare, not just executed by Russia, but also by other nations, by the terrorist organizations targeting our societies and our governments and our parliaments. And we have to resist that. So it's absolutely not necessary that North America and Europe continue to be bind together and create the same strategy and develop the same strategy and, and, and uh, policy. Short term, Russia will not change. And let's not forget despite all this fascination of AE, AI, and hybrid warfare. The immediate challenge that is posed to us is to provide credible deterrence and defense is the Putin's Russia. So what Thomas said, we have to consistently implement what our bosses, our heads of state and government decided at Warsaw. We have started, but we are not there. Also in, region, in this region, NATO need to do more, need to consolidate its military presence. The fact that we have an enduring brigade now in Poland is of huge importance. And I'm happy, it's something I learned today, I'm happy that the Americans have agreed to make it enduring. Third, the Europeans in NATO need to do much better and need to spend every effort to um, take more, sh a bigger share of the burden. I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about capabilities, I'm talking about commitment, and I'm talking about engagement in crisis management which is relevant to Europe's security. And number four, as I said already, we need to come to grips North America and Europe with a joint approach vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, the next strategic competitor and challenge for the Western community is China. Thomas, your final take on the future of this alliance? Uh, since we are entering the area of strategic competition between, uh, or re-entering the, the, the strategic com uh, competition area in, in global affairs, I think NATO is really indispensable for the transatlantic um, um, arena in terms of uh, strategic competitions with actors like Russia. And also, NATO seems to be um, a, a, a good uh, venue to start reflection on China, as was mentioned. Um, I mean, uh, it's too early to, to say how we will define, define it, but, but I think it's a good platform for, for the entire West. Um, the, the question remains open uh, regarding technological de developments because it, they, they are rather unpredictable on how they will impact the relevance of the, of the alliance, to be, to be honest. But still, I believe uh, in balance uh, it would be a... Um, I mean, NATO will uh, remain... Um, relevant also from, from that perspective. President Zadlers, you have the final word. You get the final remarks of this panel. Uh, lead us out, uh, lead us out uh, to NATO, looking ahead. Uh, 70 years NATO, we set marking. I'm not gonna ask you what the next 70 years will be, but uh, perhaps the immediate future. Uh, and at first I have to say that why NATO is so important? Bec because it delivers uh, uh, the sense uh, and perception of stability and peace, mm -hmm. what people admire, the ordinary people admire most of all. And even in, um, in our country, you know, the NATO presence was increasing, you know. Of course, we had a Russian community who were very scared we become a target, you know. 
two years later we see they are happy about this peace and stability. So that's one point. The second point is uh, uh, the conventional arms will be used less and less because they ha we have a uh, definite kind of, uh, of weapons, uh, hybrid weapons, hybrid approach, uh, how to really succeed the same goals we usually did with uh, conventional weapons. So NATO has to go very united toward this challenge to be uh, united in a hybrid space, in a cyber space, and, and understand that cyber space is without borders. Mm -hmm. So we have to be united in a space without borders. Mm -hmm. Unity and adaptability, once again, one of the key words, ladies and gentlemen. NATO at 70, uh, an accomplishment in and of itself already, an alliance that has endured for seven decades. But of course, and I think this uh, panel, this uh, wonderful panel has made it more than clear, many challenges, many new challenges uh, remain and uh, will be faced by this alliance. James Apatharai, Heinrich Braus, Thomas Jatkowski, Valdis Sutter, this was a wonderful conversation. This is your applause. Thank you so much.